Let's begin, as is our custom, with the Lord's Prayer as we open our heart again to fight the good fight of faith. Part four, the presence of God in an unlikely place. Let's look at the screen, unless you know it by heart. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And Lord, we pray also today for those that are sick with the virus, with other causes, other sicknesses, unable to be in church, we lift them up to you and ask for your healing power to work uh, on their behalf, to, to surround the plan of the enemy and bring it low and destroy it. We pray for those that have suffered the loss of loved ones. Be with them during these most difficult times. We pray uh, for all of our families that we have uh, brought to this congregation that have recently suffered such loss. Be the God who is their strength. And we ask you to help us understand the word today so that when this service is over, we may leave this place loving you more than we've ever loved you and better equipped to serve you than ever before in our lives. We ask this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, we have been talking for a few weeks about this dynamic of fighting the good fight of faith. We began by talking about understanding that there's a good fight and then there's a fight that's a bad fight. Not that anything we do for the Lord is bad, but when we do it the wrong way, we can have the best of intentions, but we can be uh, doing things that actually become counterproductive in our lives if we're not careful. So we talked about fighting the good fight of faith. We talked about the fact that we believe that the lessons we draw from the Old Testament, now there's plenty of stuff in the New Testament that we will be covering as well. But when we look at the Old Testament, I think where we are now is maybe not best typified by thinking about Israel going in to possess the land. There's a time for that because the scripture says that all of the stories of the Old Testament, all of the teaching of the Old Testament is profitable and has a purpose. But I think a closer analogy for us is Israel, Judah in particular, going into exile, into Babylon. So we said that for four or five weeks, we want to talk about this idea of being in Babylon. Now, we only got a couple of messages uh, after this uh, about this topic. I, 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 at least that's the way it feels right now. But we began last week by finding out what do we do when we find ourselves in a situation of judgment. And I've gone to great lengths over the past few weeks to explain why I believe our nation is under judgment. I don't need to recap that anymore. I don't even need to go there anymore um, or talking about the things that we spent a lot of time talking about. But I, I, I do believe that we're uh, under judgment as a nation. And I do believe that God shows mercy to the remnant. We talked last week about what to do when you find yourself in Babylon. And God told them to do several things. He said, number one, settle down. He said, understand that God's purposes are going to take time to work out. Uh, so settle down, calm down. The second thing he told us is focus on your family. Uh, James Dobson had a great idea, focus on the family. And he says, even though you don't have the temple anymore, even though you've lost your land, even though you've lost your culture and Babylon is trying to impose something alien and hostile to your faith upon you, you can still have the presence of God in your homes. You don't have the temple, but your homes can host the presence of God. And you, every time you gather together, you can host the presence of God. He said, thirdly, he said to serve the city. He said, because in the cities, shalom, you shall find shalom. And shalom's a powerful word. Shalom doesn't just mean peace. When, when uh, 
uh, people in Israel say shalom, they're not just saying peace. They're saying peace, but they're, and, they're, and they're not just saying, may your troubles be over, but they're saying, may the power of God work in your life so that everything Satan plans against you is thwarted and the grace of God fulfills. See, peace is not just the absence of hostility. Peace is the presence of God for blessing. So he said, if you'll seek the good of the city, Every time the city finds itself in peace, it will be your peace as well. He told us to pray specifically for the city, to serve the city. And then finally, he said, remember God's promise. He said, even though you're in Babylon, you're not going to stay there. It's not going to last forever. Now, um, we, we touched on this just a little bit last week, that from the Babylonian perspective, um, they ridiculed the children of Judah because in the minds of the Babylonians, your God lost. If you remember way back before uh, the kingdom of Assyria was taken over by Babylon, the Assyrian forces said, what God has ever stood before you uh, or, or before us? What God has ever won the battle uh, when the Assyrians have marched against a city. And well, we know God won that battle, but now Babylon uh, in, in the early days, but now Babylon is celebrating that unlike the days of Hezekiah, when God delivered Jerusalem, he says, now you're God lost. We tore your temple down and we chose the best and the brightest of your land to bring them into captivity. Now, loved ones, I need to say something now because I, I may forget it and go all the way through this series without mentioning it. When God brings judgment to his people, there is retribution. Now that's the final judgment of God. And we, I don't believe we see retribution until the book of Revelation when God sets everything right, when God judges everything that's wrong, when God raises his hand of judgment and there's no remedy to that judgment. We are not experiencing uh, a judgment of retribution. We are experiencing a judgment of correction where everything that God does is an opportunity for us to turn back to him. See, when God judges even his people, let me tell you what he's after. He's after corrected behavior. He's after corrected behavior. You say, well, I don't know that I understand. Well, when God targets judgment, uh, he can be very, very specific and be very, very successful. He sent them into bondage for two reasons. One was the, the sacrificing of their children. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. But he also sent them there because they kept turning to idols. And God sent them into captivity and he, this is the strange thing. He sent them to the center of child sacrifice and he sent them to the center of idolatry. Now, if I was trying to cure my child of something, I wouldn't send them into the middle of it. I would send them off to summer camp. I would send them off to a camp in Wyoming where none of this ever happens. One of the strangest things that ever happened to me, I did not understand it for years. My daddy and my granddaddy, about the time I turned 13, took me for a ride to the seedy part of town. I, I didn't understand. I knew they weren't trying to tempt me or entice me, but my dad just drove and my granddaddy, who was not even a believer, He's sitting there all bent over and he's got his, you know, his uh, Prince Albert cigarette. You know, and he's telling me, he said, boy, you don't want this life. He said, this is the life I've lived. He said, and that's why, and he was, he was my age and he's all bent over and he's, you know, he, he says, I, you don't want this life. And he started giving me a laugh. I thought I had done something and they caught me, but I realized I hadn't done anything. I was only 13 years old. And when we got back home after my granddaddy's little tour, um, my daddy said, son, I want you to know there's a real world out there and it's very evil. And he said, I wanted you to see it. He says, because I know it's going to sound good to you, just like it sounded good to me. But he said, you could tell 
the, on the looks of the faces of those people in downtown Pensacola, you could tell they weren't happy, couldn't you? And you know, he was right. I could tell of all the stuff that was going through me. I could tell he was dead right. I didn't want to be a part of that world. And it never was a problem to me to be a part of that world. Um, so sometimes, sometimes God will put you right in the middle of something that you said, I've absolutely got to have. And it's not because God said, well, if that's what you want, I'll give it to you. He's showing you, you don't want this. You don't want this. I had a friend in, in South Alabama that worked in a donut shop. The great, great donuts. And he told me, uh, I, I, or, well, he showed me where he worked. He was trying to pioneer a church. And uh, he said, I said, you know, if I worked in this place, I'd weigh 300 pounds. Because they had a policy. Employees eat all the donuts they want any time they want. And I said, I'd weigh 300 pounds. He said, yeah, that's what I thought till I started eating. And he said, I don't even like donuts anymore. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, uh, I think his name was Irby. He said, Mr. Irby has this, he had this figured out. He says, if I let you eat all the donuts you want, it won't take you long to figure out that you don't want donuts anymore. He said, I haven't had a donut in probably two years. And that's what God did to Israel. When they came out, are you guys with me? When they came out of Babylonian bondage, there's never a moment in history, never a moment in history that they have trouble with idols again. Never a moment in their history do they sacrifice their children again. It was as though God said, I'm going to send you into what you say you want to show you that's not what you want. I'm going to punish you and I'm going to teach you something while I've got you there. So loved ones, when we're undergoing the correction of the Lord, the best thing we can do is not only repent, but the best thing we can do is learn, is learn. Say, Lord, what are you showing? Now, uh, I want to talk to you today about the presence of God in an unlikely place. See, they lost the temple, they lost their culture, they lost their freedom, they lost their families. And it was a terrible time, but according to the writings of the rabbis, it, I think you can make a pretty strong case that the most difficult thing for them was the loss of the temple. They could keep their families together at home. They could sing their songs from, uh, uh, th their praise songs from the book of Psalms at home. You know, they, they, they could preserve what had been lost except the temple. There was nothing to match the temple. And it was the presence of God that they associated with the temple. They knew that God could be any place and that God was any place. But the temple was a special place. When you go to Israel um, and, and you'll do like me, you'll, you'll make your prayer request and you'll put it on a piece of paper. You'll put it in between those rocks and the, in the one part of the temple that remains the, the retaining wall, which wasn't really even part of the temple at all, but it was part of the temple ground. And you put it in there and, uh, every few months they take them and they bury them in a place of honor because they have a, a an understanding in Israel that no matter where you pray, the temple is so important that all prayer to the Jewish mind, the prayers we prayed today didn't go to the presence of God. They went to the temple and from the temple, they go to the presence of God. Now we, we don't agree with that, but it gives you an idea of how strong their tie to the temple was. And now this is taken away. So let me read part of the story and help you begin to understand how important it was. Now hear me loved ones. It is so important for us to realize, as I've said, that this world is not our home, but we have an assignment while we are here. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord handed Jehoiakim, king of Judah, over to him. Now let me explain something to you. Beginning in 606, and then later in the 590s, and then 586 was the final destruction of the temple. There were three invasions. And the first one, uh, so far as we can tell, is the one where Daniel and his friends were taken. The second one is probably where Ezekiel was taken. And the third one uh, was at the end of Jeremiah's 
ministry in the city in 586. The Lord handed Jehoiakim king of Judah over to him along with some of the vessels of the house of God and he brought them to the land of Shinar. And you go way back to Genesis 10 and 11 right in there and you remember the tower of Babel that was built on the plain of Shinar. That's where Babylon comes from. The house uh, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king told Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in whom there was no impairment, who were good looking, suitable for instruction and every kind of expertise, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge who had ability to serve the king's court, and he ordered Ashpenaz to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king also allotted for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank, and ordered that they be educated for three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. To Daniel, he assigned the name Belteshazzar. And to Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. Uh, So he sought permission from the, uh, let's see, do you have it? Uh, yeah, my notes disappeared. Um, I must have used invisible ink. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. You see, the kingdom that they were now serving, the instrument of judgment, the culture that was hostile, now says we are going to not only we've defeated you, your God failed. He couldn't take care of you. Now we are going to eat you for breakfast. You are going to be a part of our culture. We're going to change your name. We're going to change your language. We're going to change everything that you believe and everything that you once cherished, we're going to take away. Daniel is our focus today because Daniel said, I know everything has changed. It's not going back to normal. Not in my lifetime. But he said this, but I will not defile myself in the midst of what's going on. Here's the central truth. God will never put you into a place where he cannot keep you. Students at USC, God will never put you into a classroom where he can't keep you. People in a difficult workplace, God will never put you into a place where he can't protect you. Daniel's understated but understood goal in Babylon was to illustrate and live out the principle that the presence of God was more powerful than the presence of evil. Now, as we look at this and Lord Jesus, let it, let it seize our heart. There were fears and follies and foolishness. Whenever we undergo, and and you say, Pastor, this is America. When did all of this happen? I think it has been happening over the past few decades. If I had about 20 minutes, I could trace the history of secular humanism in America. And I can take you back to the 1880s when I believe we changed God. uh, And the God of, uh, of our fathers became the God called Mammon. And I can take you through the educational process, but it would take a couple of sermons probably to do that. But I think what happened is we have gradually incorporated the the idea of Babylon into our life and we've become a post-Christian America. Now there's, I still think America is the greatest nation on the face of the earth. I, I believe that. And I'm so thankful for the mercies of God. But loved ones, we've got to understand that I I think the mistakes we've made in the past few years, the past few decades, is we have chosen uh, weapons of the flesh to fight spiritual battles. Everything from marketing to politics. And we, we have lost the touch of God's spirit upon us, thinking if we can make a better product, will grow. Thinking if we can make better politics, we'll grow. Thinking if we can make better this, that, and the other, we'll grow. And we have, we have failed by, by misunderstanding that it's not by might and it's not by power, 
but it's only by the Spirit of God. Loved ones, God is bringing us back to the point where we understand that anything we can fabricate, the enemy can imitate. Anything that we can propagate, the enemy can pollute. So we must get back to the concept of it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Now, the people at this point were so angry. They were so, you remember we read Psalm 137 last week. Uh, Israel said, you've mistreated our babies, we'll mistreat your babies. You have violated our women. We want your women violated. And that was, the, that was their, one of their psalms. I mean, can you imagine coming to church praying for the destruction of a people that are your enemies? There's, there's not enough shock and awe when I said that. You're supposed to say, no, no. Yeah, that's what we're supposed to say. But Jeremiah and Daniel and Ezekiel these are three guys that are prophesying together. I mean, not, not arm in arm together, but they understood each other. They, they knew of each other and their message was the same. They understood that when judgment comes, the righteous often suffer along with the unrighteous. Now, I do believe in the remnant and I believe God can take care of the remnant, but God does not always protect the remnant from every ramification of judgment. The four devout Hebrew young men uh, that we meet in the book of Daniel were taken into captivity just as many others were. And are you ready for this? It was through no fault of their own. And I've got to tell you, we, we're not comfortable with this either. But there is judgment that will come upon us that's not judgment upon us. In fact, when you think God is judging you so harshly, you and I need to understand that we're probably the only thing that's keeping everything together. This is amazing. I wish I was out there to hear it. So what we learn from these guys is we can't cave into the what if scenarios. We must not trust in the follies of carnal alliances or solutions. These guys were already in captivity and they're sending messages back to Jeremiah's audience. You, you, you're making alliances with Ezekiel. I mean, I mean with uh, um, those people. It's Egypt. You're making alliances with Egypt. But you need to understand Egypt is not your solution. You see, isn't it amazing how our greatest enemies can somehow become our allies if we get desperate enough? You are leaning on the arm of flesh. It's like a broken crutch, the prophet would say. And, and they're saying, don't do that. We must walk through God's uh, will for us during this time. And most of all, they said, they said, don't embrace the foolishness of forsaking God and faith. Now let's look a little bit closer um, and let's look at these complications and convictions. Now, I'm, we're looking from a long way off into something that happened a long time ago, and we don't have all the answers. We don't know when it happened. It, it could have been that Daniel had settled this before he ever left Jerusalem, or it may be something he had to work through, but whatever, he worked through it quickly. Daniel moved to the place of victory over rage, anger, and fear. His image of slaughtered women and children had been subsumed into his vision of God. He was outraged at what had happened to his people. But he had, he had seen something bigger with his spiritual eyes than he saw with his natural eyes. He saw the wretchedness of the invasion of Babylon. He saw the, the unfaithfulness of the people of, uh, of Edom. He saw women raped. He saw babies smashed against the rocks. And he had a, vi a vision of that in his mind. But somehow, and, and loved ones, this isn't about what he did or how he did it. In fact, every one of us have got to get to the point where the, our vision of God covers every other vision that we have, every other hurt that we have, every other disgust that we have. Now, it doesn't mean we're not saved if we can't do that, but I'm telling you that's your top priority. It's my top priority. We've got to put God back on the throne so that everything 
is covered by his presence. That's why the angels could say uh, in the presence of the Lord, holy, 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 the whole earth is full of his glory. And that was said at a time of amazing abominations and wickedness. There are days that I wake up and say they must have been smoking something to say the whole earth earth is full of his glory but what we all must learn is what the angels know we can only say the earth is full of the glory of the Lord when we live in his presence because if we live in the newspapers if we live in the reports of this world we'll never be able to say that with any sense of conviction now we know what God told him to do I just went over that you know calm down pray for the city do this that and the other um, but Daniel and his friends were faced immediately in chapter one with this difficult question. To what extent can I engage this present culture without compromising my convictions? Right. To what extent can I engage this present culture without compromising my convictions? You see, when we, when we live in a world that is predominantly Christian influenced. It's a lot easier to live by your convictions. I, I talked to a man that was part of the Azusa Street Revival. And um, he's, he's, I said, well, I said, things just, you know, and I, this was in the 70s, you know, that I was talking to him, the age of, uh, you know, the age of mini skirts and, and, and wild woolly music and all of these things that the church was preaching against. And uh, I said, how, how, he, I said, what was it like? What was the big temptation back in those days? Now, that, now he, he told me about his own day of sin. He, he was old enough to be my father, almost, well, really old enough to be my grandfather. He said, oh yeah, I had a day of sin. He said, I was at Southwestern Bible College and I just had enough. I just had to have a day of sin. And I thought, oh man, I said, what did you do? He said, I, me and my friends, we went out and on a Saturday, I smoked three packs of camels and saw a Tarzan movie. He said, that was my day of sin. I said, that, that was your day of sin? He said, yeah, I went home, I got it out of my system. I was all right Sunday. And I said, that, that you know, to myself, I thought three packs of camels and, and a Tarzan movie, it, but, but that was raunchy in those days, you know. Uh, in, in a Pentecostal church. He said, um, he said well, you got to understand. He said, in those days, rebellion was a, was a spirit that worked rather than something that you saw. He said, for instance, he says, he says women, whether they were saved or lost, pretty well dressed alike. He said, oh, we had the flappers in the 20s. There were, there were moments, but he said, he said, you couldn't tell if a woman was, uh, was moral or immoral by the way she dressed. They dressed pretty much alike. Uh, he said, men, we dress pretty much alike. He said, he said, the only way, he said, in my experience, the only way you could tell a person that was on fire for God and a person that wasn't was by looking at their shoes. I said, looking at their shoes? He said, yep. He said, that was the telltale sign. I said, what, were there brands that were? He said, no. And he put his hands on my shoulders. He started weeping. He said, son, in those days, a man or woman of God spent so much time in prayer, their shoes were bent at the toes and their shoes had folds in them that you didn't have from anything else other than kneeling to pray. And I thought, to show you how mature I was, I thought, what if you took your shoes off when you prayed? Nobody would know. <laughs> what, what, what he was, what he was, what I'm trying to say, listen to me, loved ones, is the more homogenous a culture is, the more alike a culture is, the less daunting the challenge to stand for your convictions. And, and, and when we become a country that increases in diversity, uh, and you never know which group, you know, uh, at what point does a Christian nation become a Muslim nation? We, when, whenever you have so many different ideas of what is right and wrong, it can become very, very difficult for us to, to understand that when we're all alike, basically, it's not a big deal to fit in with your convictions. But sometimes things happen and it becomes very difficult.
My hope today is that we can draw some principles from Daniel and his friends that will keep us on track. This message is about living your faith with the long view. Now, there's one more message, maybe two, that I want to preach out of this context of Babylon. I I want to talk to you about the power of conscience and convictions. Please hear me when I say this. One of the things that the church must rediscover, and I'm not talking so much about our church as all churches, the church must rediscover the idea of a clear conscience and convictions that we live by a clear conscience and convictions. And we need to bring an unpopular topic back to the table. This thing called standards of holiness. We need to understand what it means to really live as light in a dark age. Now, sometimes finding these principles is easy and is nothing than more or less just us becoming quiet, peaceful model citizens. You know what? There's nothing wrong with praying for a quiet, peaceful life. That's what Paul told us to pray for. He told Timothy, he says, pray for kings and those in authority. Um, by the way, I had probably six or seven people last week say, I, I just, I, there are some leaders I don't want to pray for. And, and I understand that. But the fact of the matter is we have a command. We have a command to pray for them. Now you need to understand this. When you pray for your leaders, that doesn't mean you pray for the success of all their agenda. But you pray for God to give them wisdom. You pray for God to touch their heart. You pray for God to help them know the right thing to do. And Paul said, pray for kings and those in authority. Why? So that you can live a quiet, peaceable, godly life. He says, that's the will of God. The will of God isn't for you to have your bowels in an uproar all the time, as my dad used to say. He said, the will of God is for you to live quiet, peaceable, godly lives. But sometimes society won't let us do that. Sometimes Christians are maligned and falsely accused. As in the days of Nero, I want to recommend a movie to you. It's very sobering and you, you might not want your small children to watch it, but it's called Paul, an Apostle of Christ. Jim Caviezel plays the part of Luke, and I forget the actor that plays Paul. It's a very accurate look. It's just a slice of Christianity in the first century. But Paul is in his second imprisonment at Rome, and the church has been accused of burning down the city of Rome. Uh, Nero blamed them for that when history has confirmed that Nero was the one responsible, not the church. But sometimes Christians are maligned and falsely accused as in the days of Nero. Now, let's move on a little bit more. In some circumstances, Christians have been forced to become lawbreakers, at least in the, uh, the eyes of society. Let me give you for instance. And by the way, Peter gives us this. He said, if any of you suffer for being a Christian, let it be for doing what is right, not for doing what is wrong. Um, I, I, I think pastors need to stand up and say, you know, Christians do not make our case for Christianity by being lawbreakers. But sometimes you are put in a place where you have to make a decision. Am I going to obey God or am I going to obey men? Now, this is a, for instance, the midwives of Egypt refused to kill the babies that were birthed by the um, Israeli Israelite mothers. And the Bible says that God blessed them. And every time I teach that in SESL or some, some format, they say, I just don't understand God blessing people for lying. Well, loved ones, you've got to understand God wasn't blessing them for lying. God was blessing them for putting the children first above the law of the land. So, so don't, don't misunderstand what God was blessing. What God was blessing was their guarding the lives of the babies. Take another example. The apostles refused to be silent in proclaiming the gospel, even when ordered to do so by the Sanhedrin and the temple police. Peter put it this way. He says, you you judge for yourself. What's the right thing to do for us to obey God or for us to obey man? Uh, Believers in the early church Uh, Now, Rome didn't persecute the Christians immediately. Um, 
<coughs> Roman persecution was a second wave of persecution. But by the time Rome began persecuting the church, they had moved to the point of emperor worship. They said the emperor was divine. And they said, when you pay your taxes, all you have to do is take a pinch of incense, sprinkle it into the fire and say, Kaiser Kurios or Caesar is Lord. That's all you got to do. They didn't even require that you believe it. You just had to do it. But one by one, Christians realized it may seem a little thing to some people, but they would not take the pinch and put it in the fire and say, Kaiser Kurios, even though they could go on their way. No, they had to be true to themselves. They took the incense. If they took the incense at all, they took it and they said this, Christos Kurios, Christ is Lord. And they realized that even though it was just business as usual to Rome, even though society said it's no big deal, just do this, you can go on your way. They said, we cannot even in a casual moment give in to the idea that Caesar is Lord when only Jesus is Lord. So what do we do when we're told to engage and bless a society of paganism and yet keep the poison out of our own lives and homes? Loved ones, some Christians through the, the centuries have decided to withdraw. And I'm not judging them because that's, that makes sense. It, 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 it wasn't... In my estimation, looking back on church history, it wasn't the best thing to do just to withdraw and become a hermit. But some of them had families to protect. Some of them just didn't want to be a part of this world. Then we had, um, it, it went from the hermits to um, villages or abbeys where there were those that retreated behind the walls of an abbey, but they still blessed the community around them. In much of Europe for, for decades and decades and decades, the villages sprang up around abbeys where God was focused on and that was God's territory. But they made sure that they created a village around the abbey to help people. I'm telling you, it's not as easy as we might think. So what do we do when we're in a situation and we can't leave? We don't have land in some undisclosed location. What do we do when we're part of a system, but we're not of the system? Now, let me, let me go a little bit deeper and then we're going to wrap this up. We're going to try to land this plane. What does, where does the conflict come from? Pastor, I'm not sure. I, I've lived in America 80 years and I've never, I've never seen anything like this. I need to understand what you're talking about. Well, you've got to understand our culture has morphed into post-Christian America. And some of the trouble that we have as Christians may come from cultural expectations. Um, your child is laughed at. Your child is mocked at school, not because they've broken a law, but because they don't fit in to the things that the rest of the children might do. And I want to tell you, there, there are, there, there's, there's nothing quite as, well, I won't say nothing. There are few things as powerful as peer pressure in the life of a child. And that's why you need to be so affirming of your children. Get rid of your conditional love. Get rid of your, I'll love you if you'll do this. Or, you know, if you ever do this, you got to leave home. You need to get rid of that, loved ones. And you need to be sure that your children understand that home is a refuge, a very present help in times of trouble. And you say, well, pastor, you just didn't have trouble with peer pressure. I had very little trouble with peer pressure, very little trouble with peer pressure. You say, well, that's because you were St. Stephen. No, it's because I tell you, I, 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 I can tell you this with all my heart. I did not want to disappoint my brothers. I did not want to disappoint my mother and my father and my grandmother who lived with us. I, it, it wasn't that there was no temptation, but my home was such a special place to me. Why would I give up that home for anything that they could offer me out there? So it can come from cultural expectations. Number two, some conflict can come from social media domination. We're seeing it now, the, the censorship and the labeling. And I know that there's so much out there being reported and there's so much out there that's, uh, you know, being said. Most of us don't even know what's true and not true. But 
the fact of the matter is, we know at least on some level, there is censorship and labeling on Facebook and other, and other platforms. Not everybody and not everything, but loved ones, I want to tell you, there, there is an incredible pressure that people are caving into in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ today. And it is social media. We don't want to be disliked. Some conflict may come through local, state, and federal laws that are hostile toward freedom of religion. Now, I know, especially with the COVID that we've had to deal with, I don't think every governor and every mayor was out to destroy the church. I think some are just trying to do the best they know how to do, and they don't know how to solve the problem because it's so huge and it's so widespread. But loved ones, I want to say, I guarantee you there are some governors and there are some mayors and there are some political figures that it is their intent to seize upon this to silence the church. I, I'm, I'm telling you, it's there. Now you say, well, name three. Oh no, I'm not going to do that. But I am telling you, we need to understand that um, even our local laws and our federal laws and our state laws, they may be given for our good, but that's not the motive behind those that are signing the orders. In every instance. Now, and please don't send me an email saying, well, I know so-and-so. It's not true of them. I know it's not true of them too. I, I, listen to what I'm saying, not what you think I'm saying. I'm not saying this is what everything's like this. I'm saying this is some of the things we're having to contend with. Okay. Some conflict may come through workplace regulations. It has nothing to do with state law or local law or federal law. It's just a workplace regulation. A workplace rule that is so onerous toward people of faith. There's no law that says you can't do this, but if you do this, you're going to get fired. There may be other sources as well. So you say, Pastor, what you're saying is we have to guard our Christianity. Let me, let me give you two things to think about. And I want you to teach this to your children. And I want you college students to research what I'm saying because you're being told stuff in a lot of classes that's just not true. And you're being presented with a scenario that's just not true. There are two profound errors that are being taught in America today and are being bought hook, line, and sinker. One is the wall of separation between church and state. That's a statement that is used. It's being taught and enforced with the exact opposite meaning of its original intention. When you track down the origin of the separation between church and state or the wall of separation between church and state, it was not saying that the church can't have anything to do with politics. It was saying just the opposite. Politics can't have anything to do with the church. It was given as an assurance to the citizens of a state and it was said that there has been erected a wall of separation between state and church or church and state for this purpose. We came here from a nation where the government had influence in our religion. We came here looking for religious freedom that was denied us by the federal and local government. So we have ensured the right that even if government doesn't like it, they cannot interfere with our religious liberty. That's what we were promised and, and we are being lied to that it means we can have no public voice. Here's the second thing we need to understand. We hear this more and more. You may have the right, but there are consequences of rights. That's a big thing going around in, in uh, our universities. That's a big thing going around in our political circles right now. Well, you have the right of speech, but you need to understand there are consequences to what you say. You may have the right to do this. You may have the right to do that. You may have the right to religious expression, but we have the right to, to get, have consequences. What they're saying is, yeah, it's a right, but we have the right to nullify your right. I don't know if I'm making sense to you. The statement eviscerates the idea of a right being guaranteed as a right at all. What we are being taught today in America is, yes, you can hold your rights, but we will ostracize you, we will fine you, we will even imprison you if you insist on exercising your rights. Now what do we do? Well, let's go to Babylon. Let's, let's figure out how we live in Babylon. <coughs> the first thing we need to remember is that Daniel did not withdraw from the culture. He engaged it. 
He believed the presence of God was more powerful than the presence of evil. And we must reclaim that level of faith. Now, when I say engage the culture, you, I, I'm not talking about doing foolish things. As Jim Croce used to say, you don't spit into the wind. You don't, you don't pull on Superman's cape. And you don't take the mask off the old Lone Ranger. There's some things that are just stupid to do. And we have a lot of Christians that think the more stupid my actions, the greater my faith. No, we're told to be as wise as serpents, but to be as harmless as doves. We need to understand that, yes, there's a place where we stand and we resist, but we need to choose those places very carefully. Now, on the other hand, we are not in the business of syncretism. Christianity is not to be blended with any other religion. There is no God but Jehovah. We are to ensure, hear me now, we are to ensure the religious rights of all Americans. We need to be willing to fight and die for the right of the Muslim community to erect a mosque right across the street from us. That's their right. And we need to defend their right. But we do not have to become Chrislam to enforce their right. We are to ensure the religious rights of all Americans, whether they are Christian or not, but we are free to use every legitimate means to protect, promote, and propagate Christianity as our preferred way of life. And I want to tell you something, parents. I know my kids are grown, but the voice of the culture must be contended with in our homes. We need to know what our children are being taught. And again, I know not every school is bad. Every school district's not bad. Certainly every teacher's not bad. We have an abundance of teachers in our church here. We're not trying to say everything about that is wrong, but we are saying a culture is bent in a direction and we have to contend against those voices. They, okay, now let's, let's get to the nuts and bolts. There are decisions in which we may have latitude. By that we mean there are, there are ways we can deal with things in which there's more than one legitimate way to deal with some issues. But there are also issues where Christians must draw the line in the sand. Now here is what all of this today is about. Two questions. Where do we draw the line? Number one. And number two, how do we live after we draw the line? How do we treat people after we draw the line? And that is answered in our Christian life lessons I'm going to be very concise, but there are six of them that I think we need to wrap our heads around and begin to put them in our repertoire of Christianity. Here's number one. I've already talked about this, so this one will be a quick and fast one. In a homogenous culture, the rules are more easily defined and accepted. This is what we had in earlier eras. I want to tell you that until about the middle, maybe the late first part of the 20th century, Christianity, or excuse me, America was basically a homogenous culture. Uh, we all lived our lives on the principle of the Judeo-Christian ethic. Almost everyone did. I told you at the founding of our nation, it was, it was near, nearly 80% of, Christ, of the public that went to church uh, every week. It, we, had a, we had a common culture. Now, and, and even within that common culture, we had common cultures within the common culture. When immigrants from Italy came to New York, to Ellis Island, they tended to go together to the same neighborhood. Now, sometimes that happened because there was discrimination. They weren't allowed in other neighborhoods. But most often, as far as we can tell, it was because they wanted to go to a neighborhood, a culture they were familiar with. Uh, and and that, was, that was both a good and bad thing, I guess. But it was understandable. Um, th that's number one. When you are in a culture that is basically the same, it's a lot easier to, to stand by your convictions. Because even if they aren't the convictions of others, they, they are understood. Here's number two. It may be that the brightest lights in dark times are those who have overcome the greater offense. Um, I, I just want to take Daniel and his three friends as an example. We do not know this. I, I want you to understand, we don't know this. But it is at least likely, 
I, I, I won't say probable, but they were put in very high profile positions and it was the nature of the kingdoms of those days. It wasn't a, a habit in the nation of Israel, thank God. But in, in pagan cultures, when, when men were brought into the service of the king where they would be in the palace or near the king, they were often castrated. And the reason they were castrated is so that the king could know that his wives weren't being, uh, having, you know, rendezvous and affairs with, with those who worked in the, in the palace. It was cruel. It was barbaric. Um, when, when you were made to be a eunuch, you often died either from blood loss or from infection that was resulted. It was a, it was a horrible judgment that, uh, or, or decision that these men had to live through. Now we don't know that Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were made eunuchs, but there's two things that argue for it. Number one, the positions they had, very high positions, would have, you know, coming in as outsiders, coming in as outsiders, they would not have been protected from the shame of being a eunuch. They might not have known where they were going to go, but they knew they were going to serve high. Just take care of this from the beginning. Um, it would have been logical for them to be eunuchs. And number two, we don't read anything. We don't have any reference. And we see Daniel there the rest of his life. We see Daniel from a teenager to a man in his 80s. And there's no mention of a family, no mention of children, no mention of a wife. So it's at least arguable and likely, if not probable, that they were made eunuchs. Now, can I tell you something? I put myself in... Daniel's place. And I can't envision a scenario where I'm going to love and serve that man. You know, he did this to me. Yet we find that when God's judgment is coming upon Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar will lose his mind, Daniel interpreted the dream and Daniel said, Oh, King, I wish this were about your enemies instead of about you. If this scenario is right, he is standing up and serving the man that made him a eunuch. Ah, it's a tough one to wrap our heads around. It, it, it really is. They had every reason to hate Nebuchadnezzar and all the other overseers as well. Now the point, listen to me, loved ones, the point is not an appeal to minimize wrongs. The point is not saying, oh, well, it was no big deal. Things happen. Life happens. And no, that's not what I'm saying. It was not right. It was never justifiable. It was never something you just pat them on the back and say, well, bad things happen to good people. That's not my point. My point is that we need to learn to deal with whatever wrongs have been perpetrated against us as God gives us the grace to do so. So many times we expect people that have been mistreated. We expect people that have been hurt. We expect people that grew up under the oppression of Jim Crow. We just say, well, just forgive and forget. And, and, and that's a foolish thing to say because it's such a marking, scarring thing. We can't just say, oh, just forgive and forget. But what we must do, I don't even know that we have the right to say it to them. But what we must do is understand that the way out of that is to let God's grace help you deal with that. Not minimize it, not marginalize it, but let God help you deal with it or you're going to be under the curse of that thing all of your life. I don't know how they did it and, and they may not have been eunuchs. But if they were, You've got to understand that somewhere along the line, these men, these men understood that few people have been done wrong more than we have. But we are going to serve in spite of it. Some of you today that may have the most difficult thing and you say, Pastor, you don't understand me. And I may not. Or you may say, my wife doesn't understand me and she may not. Or you may say, my boss doesn't understand me and she may not. I understand that. But the issue is not that your hurt is so profound. It is. But the issue is that God's grace is more profound than your hurt. And you've got to let him help you. Nobody can do that for you. If you wait for those that wronged you to make it right, you're going to be waiting a long time. Number three, let's move on. 
there is a difference between living in a pagan culture and participating in a pagan culture. When facing a clash of cultures, we need to ask, is there an alternative that can be integrated? Daniel, and guys, we've got to fight well. Daniel could have said, well, we're not eating. We're not, we're not going to eat this food that's offered to idols. We're not going to drink wine that's been offered to idols. We're just not going to do it, praise God. And they would have probably been killed and been a footnote in history. But this is what he did. He said, we can't do that. Are you hearing me? He, there was a point they had to draw the line. He drew the line and he said, we might can do this. We might can do this, but we can't do this. We can't do this. But let me give you some alternatives, Ashpenaz. He said, we believe that God is able to bless us by saying no to the king's commands. We know what the king's after. He's after us looking good. He's after us being sharp. And he says, this is what we're asking you to do. Just feed us black eyed peas and cornbread for 10 days. Just 10 days. Just let us eat peas and cornbread. And at the end of the 10 days, if we don't look better, and if we don't perform better than everybody else in our class, then I won't ask you to do it anymore. Now, he was prepared to suffer. He was prepared. He was prepared to stand and, and, and be, be killed for standing by his convictions. But Ashpenaz, his head was on the chopping block as well. And a lot of times we think we're really standing for God by saying, well, I'm just not going to do that. But what you're doing, you're not being a witness to those around you. You're being a stumbling block to them. And you've got to understand, they have something at risk as well. A Christian doctor can associate with an abortionist, but that's not the same as performing an abortion. A teacher can associate with colleagues who disagree with him or her on matters of sexuality, but what the Christian teacher cannot do is teach ideas that are clearly contrary to Scripture. Loved ones, I think we're moving into an age, and I, I don't want to be offensive by saying this, but we have got to learn to draw a line and stop doing it in an, in an offensive, hostile, mean-spirited way. Now, let me repeat. The two big moments we've got to face, where do I draw the line and how do I act when I draw the line? Okay? It's easy in a homogenous culture to have standards, the more diverse the culture is, the more difficult it is. It may be that your most painful events in life will give you a greater opportunity to shine brightly as you overcome those things. There's a difference, number three, between living in a pagan culture and participating in a pagan culture. Here's number four. Choose your battles well. See, not every battle has moral equivalency. See, a lot of times, I, and I hear it, I, I hear it coming from all kinds of Christians. Well, this is wrong, but so is this. Yeah, but this isn't anywhere near compared to this. You know, you, you did wrong. You, 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 you shot my dog. Yeah, I did shoot your dog, but you let grass clippings fly over into my yard. Didn't rake them up. You did wrong too. Please, please, don't try to make grass clippings and dog killing the same thing. Don't, don't, try, to, don't try to deal with abortion, talking about things that are far less than abortion. You see, we've got to understand there are battles to fight, but we have to choose our battles well. Daniel said, hey, here's things we're going to draw the line over. You can change my name. I'll go by Belteshazzar. I'll learn the, the Chaldean language. But I cannot eat food offered to idols. I cannot make an accommodation to other gods. I, I, I cannot be told that I cannot pray to God like I always have, you know, later with the lion's den. You say, but, but pastor, we, this, this, we just, we just got to hold the line. Some places you hold the line. 
Listen to what Paul said in difficult circumstances. Now, guys, this is the most important thing I'm going to say all day the next, next 15 minutes. So this is where you want to pay attention. If you've been sleeping, it's okay, but wake up now. <laughs> Paul said, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Praise God. Oh, I'm a member of Christian life. We don't associate with sexually immoral people. Let Paul finish his sentence. I did not mean, or I did not at all mean with the sexually immoral people of the world or with the greedy or swindlers or with idolaters. If you were going to stay away from them, you would have to leave the world. But actually, I wrote to you not to associate with any so called brother if he is a sexually immoral person or greedy or an idolater or is verbally abusive or habitually drunk, or a swindler. Don't even eat. I mean, don't even have communion with such a person. For what business of mine is it to judge outsiders? You know, I, I remember years and years ago, there was a big thing. Let's, let's boycott Disney. And don't get me wrong. I, I agree there are times to boycott. But back in those days, it was over a relatively minor offense. And I looked at it and I said, you're wanting me to boycott Disney because they're not acting Christian? They're not Christian. They're a business. And now Disney has done some things they need to be boycotted over. But I'm talking about back in the days when, when uh, you know, uh, Mickey Mouse had just graduated from black and white to color. <laughs> I said, I'm not going to demand that they be Christian when they're not a Christian organization. I said, you know what bothers me more? I said, this venomous attitude in the church. That's what Paul was saying. He says, do you not judge those who are within the church, but those, uh, those who are outside, God judges. Remove the evil person from among yourselves. What Paul was saying, he says, yeah, we need to hold a standard of holiness. We need to be right. We need to be adamant that there are ways to live and ways we don't live. He says, but that's for you. He said, leave the world alone except to love them and bring them into the kingdom. He was saying, choose your battles well. Number five, we must allow fellow believers to settle true matters of conscience as they see fit under God. Now, guys, this is huge. This is huge because the church has not done this historically. The church has not done this. In scripture, some things are wrong under any circumstances. It doesn't matter how you feel about them. They're wrong. You're never right to have an adulterous affair. You're never right to do that. It's wrong under any circumstances. There are also some things that are right under any circumstances. To live holy lives, to pray. It's always right, even if a law says it's not. But I want to tell you, this is where mature Christians need to step up right now. There are also some things that are subject to perspective and circumstance. Let me ask you a couple of tough questions. What would you do, and please don't answer out loud because you'll probably embarrass me or you won. What if I'm asked to attend the same sex marriage of my niece or even of my daughter or my son? What do you do? <laughs> I told you not to answer. <laughs> Roy just said, I'd call you. <laughs> He's a wise man, wise man. <laughs> or should I join in a prayer meeting with people who disagree with me on important issues? I'm constantly asked to join prayer meetings where we want to take authority over this or we want to bind this. And I, I, I believe in binding and loosing, but I know that those people coming together are not at a place of maturity to start dealing with principalities and powers. We declined having something at our church, not because we disagreed with what was being prayed, but we did not want to open our church to the lack of wisdom that was clearly going to be manifested in that meeting by taking authority in places we didn't yet have authority to take. You say, well, pastor, if it, if it, was, if it, was, if it was my daughter, I'd just say, Girl, you were raised better than that. You know we don't believe in same-sex marriage. And I'm not coming because if I was to come, it would just show that I'm caving in to your uh, blatant doctrinal disregard. 
Or would you say, that's my baby? That's my baby girl. I'm not going to win her by making her an enemy. I want her to know, like God, that, that, that there's nothing she can do that will make me love her more. And there's nothing she can do that will make me love her less. And some of you right now, you are so angry. You, you are just spitting with rage because you say, well, it's clear this is right. It's clear that's wrong. There is no chapter and verse to deal with an issue like that. So we have to make our own decision according to our conscience. Now, there may be times where you say, you know, maybe it's a little further removed than a child, but I, I can't endorse it. I, I'll, I'll explain, but I can't endorse it. Or it may be so close that you say, I have to walk with great care here because I, in an attempt to do what I believe is right, I could actually alienate someone from the kingdom forever. Now, guys, this, I, know, I know some of you don't like that. But we need to understand we are in an age when that kind of thing is more and more coming to the table. You say, Pastor, I don't like you telling me I'm wrong. I didn't tell you you were wrong. I said, what are you going to do? You know, after last week's message, and I got permission to share this, somebody in anger said, well, so you're saying I can't do anything. I said, I just gave you five things to do. I said, the problem is, and thank you for letting me share this unknown person. I said, the problem is you don't like any of my five things I'm telling you to do. Romans 14 is dedicated to the conflict within the church of eating meat that had been offered to idols. It's worth us taking just a few minutes to understand this because that's an abstract thing to us. That's not an issue in our society. So we don't take the seriousness of it to heart and we read it and it doesn't really make a big deal in our life. But this had to do with the very core of their existence. Many of the Christians were Jews who had been set free from dietary restrictions. That was a huge thing. Uh, uh, to them, a huge thing that I can eat a pork chop or bacon, you know, w without condemnation because food had been sanctified by prayer and the word of God. And that, that, that's a, a long session of dealing with that. But now you're telling me that I can even eat it if it's offered to idols. And here on one hand, the church had been given freedom in regard to diet. On the other hand, they knew that pagans served or sold food that had been offered to idols. And then it gets further complicated in the King James English. King James uses the word the weaker brother. So we say, oh yeah, I can eat uh, meat offered to idols or whatever we want it to be. I can drink wine or I can watch a Red Sox game or I can do whatever I want to do because I'm stronger, but people that have trouble with it are weaker. Uh, all that word meant was sensitive. It had nothing to do with strength or revelation or understanding. Paul wasn't saying those who are weak Christians can't eat the meat. Those of us who are strong can. You know, he said to some of us, he called them stronger. It's not an issue to us. But to others, there is an issue. And he called them weaker or more sensitive. What's not an issue to me is an issue to them. And this is what Paul said. He said, we know that when we bless food, we uh, remove any ploy of the enemy to work against us, even if it had been offered to idols. In fact, it was such a no brainer to Paul that when we pray over our food, God blesses it. He said, when you're going to a place and somebody offers you meat, he says, if you're wondering, is this offered to idols or not? He says, just be quiet and eat. Just be quiet and eat. He says, it's not worth the controversy you're going to cause at the table. Just let it go. He says, this is what I know. The food is sanctified by prayer, even if it's offered to idols. But he also said this, there's another reality that every time someone offers food, uh, offers uh, a meal that has meat offered to idols, he said, we know that those idols are not real, but we know that demons work behind those idols. So he said, this is, this is something that either argument 
is substantive and either argument can make the difference. But listen to what Paul said. He said, I can eat it, no problem. I can go to the South Carolina, well, the South Macedonian State Fair and eat that 12, 18 inch corn dog. I can, you know, I, I can do that. I have that freedom. But he says, is it worth what it does to those who don't agree with me to do it? He said, no. You know, we, we have a lot of people saying, well, I'm free to do this. I'm free to do that. But do you know that you're also free to not do that? You're also free to not do that. Uh, the argument isn't, are you free to do it? The argument is it the best thing to do. And that's what Paul said. And Levin was going to tell you something. Some of you, if, if, if your child or your, let, let's remove it a little further from home, you know, your niece or your nephew, if they said, this is what I'm going to do and I want you to come celebrate with me, you have to make the decision, what message do you send? What message are you sending by going? What message are you sending by not going? And you've got to understand, here, this is the, one of the beautiful things about Christianity. When something's not clearly defined in Scripture, we have the Holy Spirit and a conscience that we work within. But now I want to tell you this. Don't say, I knew it was okay for me to shack with that old woman. No, no. Some things are wrong regardless of what you have freedom to do. Some things are right, whether or not you agree with it. We're not talking about scripture. We're talking about those unknowns. And this is what they were learning in Babylon. Uh, we, can, we can do this, but we can't do this. We'll, we'll serve the government this way, but we can't serve the government that way. And loved ones in days ahead, if we're right, unless we turn the culture, what we're going to find as we're in a culture that's more and more hostile to Christianity, you've got to make good decisions of where you draw the line and where you take a step back. You say, well, that's, I call that compromise. Well, that's why you're not pastor. You don't understand it. Here's number six, and we close with this. God will help you know where the line needs to be drawn. James 1, verses 2 through 5, Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom... Let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. God says, you're in situations you don't know what to do. Come to me. You've got to make decisions you don't know how to make. Come to me. You are in risk of being criticized for doing A, and you're in risk of being criticized for doing B, come to me and I will generously and without hesitation give wisdom to you so that you can be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. See, our goal in these days ahead are not to minimize the effect of Christianity. Our goal is to enhance the role of Christianity. We've asked you to come to the Lord's table today. We've asked you to let us end this service by saying, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You see, whenever you receive the cup and eat the bread, you're really saying what I talked about in this sermon. You're saying... I want to partner with you, Lord. I remember what you did. And I remember what you're going to do. And I know what you're doing in my life right now. So, Father, as I eat this bread, help me to remember that your body was given for me so I can give my life for you. As we drink the cup, we remember that it washes away our sins. You see... 
we are entering an age where in America, now many of the church, much of the church world already knows this, but in Western civilization, we're entering an, we're entering an age of hostility toward the church. Now you say, well, but still it's not as bad as it is here or there. I, thank God I know that. I know that. But what America will look like for our children and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren, that's what I'm fighting for. That's what I'm fighting for. Let's take the bread. You at home, whatever you've got, God can make it a holy substitute. Paul took the bread and he explained to the Corinthians, he said, in the same night he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread and broke it and blessed it and said, this represents my body which was given for you. He said, when you come together as a covenant, as a sign of where your allegiance lies, eat the bread together. Now we'll drink in just a moment, but all who would like to participate, let's just eat the bread together now. In the same manner, Paul said he took the cup and he said, this is the New Testament of my blood. Every one of them understood what he was saying. He says, he says for 2,000 years or more, he said, animals have been slaughtered and their blood was a reminder of the consequence of sin, the high penalty of sin. He said, you know from the scripture that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. But he said, this is the new blood. And no longer does your sacrifice have to be renewed at every offense or renewed every holy day or renewed at the day of atonement. He says, I am the lamb that is the sufficiency for every sin. With that in mind, let's drink together. Now, Lord, it's time for us to go. We're learning how to find your presence in the most unlikely of places. I pray that as we close out with some worship and some time spent in your presence, we ask in the name of Jesus that you would help us, take us by the hand and walk us through those tough places we're in. Father, we want to serve you. I, I look over this church. I know these people want to serve you. The people at home want to serve you. Brown Chapel, we want to serve you, Lord. People unable to be here because of the virus, we want to serve you. I'm not scolding anyone. But Lord, sometimes circumstances can seem so daunting that we say, where are you, Lord? Where are you, Lord? Why, Lord, have you allowed this? How long will you allow it to go on? Why this? Why now? Why me? I'm asking today that you will touch people wherever they are, that they will understand the love of God is all over them. There's nothing they can do that will make you love them any more than you already do. Father, as we dismiss, some will just worship for a while. Others will want to come forward here in the sanctuary and over in Brown Chapel. They'll want to come forward and then go out to the prayer area where ministry teams await. Others at home may want to pray for one another or call in the number that will be on the screen and say, I want to know more about Jesus. I need prayer for a special battle. Father, we know you are more than enough. We ask you to show yourself mighty in Jesus' name. Amen.